Sleep like a baby. Not. <laughs> Anyone who's ever had a baby knows that that statement is utterly wrong. <laughs> I don't know please, how else to put it. Please, because please, it's wrong. Absolutely. And, and um, you know, followed very closely by, you know, the best piece of advice I ever had was catch up on your sleep before you have your baby. Because once <laughs> you've got children, it always becomes a challenge. And if you're anything like me, I need a lot of sleep to function properly. Mm -hmm. So thank you, everyone, who is joining us live or listening to our replay. Um, as always, although we have missed one or two sessions, sorry for that, we've missed you. <laughs> um, we are doing our mother, doctor, nurse live today, and I'm joined by the wonderful Sarah Hunstead, pediatric nurse and founder of CPR Kids and also mum of two young ladies. And um, my name is Dr. Deb Levy. I am a pediatrician and also mum of two even younger ladies. <laughs> so we've all been in the trenches with you when it comes to sleep. My one daughter mm -hmm. still doesn't sleep fantastically. Usually it's Sarah who's sharing all her horrific stories on, on, um, on our lives. But I think I can throw a few in here. Um, yep. So we thought that we'd talk about sleep today mainly because I guess mainly for two reasons. And Sarah, just jump in and talk over me whenever oh, you want well, to but yeah. I guess two reasons one it's a it's a problem and I'm going to call it that that all of us experience at some stage with our children mm -hmm. and then two recently there's been some media around self-prescribing melatonin for children in other words mums mm -hmm. and dads or other carers going online and buying melatonin from um overseas companies so that's Absolutely. kind of what's gotten us onto the whole like let's talk a bit more about sleep it is and deb did a fantastic instagram mm. live yesterday so go um you can see uh deb's uh, oh, handle, deb's yeah, handle is down below you can see that right there <laughs> i know because yeah i can't do that at the moment my brain is not functioning <laughs> enough to be able to point the right way um so please go and have a look at um, deb's instagram page for that but what i was hoping deb if you don't mind um, mm -hmm. just for those who are time poor and can't quite catch up on that, although I recommend you yeah. do, please don't do it. Can you just give us a couple of the highlights out of that? So is it okay to be giving the child melatonin that you've just bought from, you know, the interwebs? Okay. Um, as a general rule, I'm going to say no. Um, I'm just going to backtrack a little bit, Sarah, and say my overall opinion on of melatonin for children is that there's definitely a place for it. Um, and this is usually children who are older. I certainly wouldn't be recommending it in babies, toddlers, um, infants. And um, that should always be under the guidance of a healthcare provider on the proviso that the question of why isn't your child sleeping also been addressed. So there's no point in giving your child something to help them to fall asleep if there's actually something that's keeping them awake. In other words, it could be reflux, it could be parasites, it, you know, it could be allergies, it, it could really food intolerances, it could be a whole lot of stuff. So um, mm -hmm. I don't think that it should be something that is a knee-jerk reaction for families to go, oh my goodness, I'm exhausted. I can't sleep my child because my child's not sleeping, you know, let's just do try the gummies that everyone else in, in you know, in the mother's group is trying. Um, although it's very tempting. And as I said, I do have a child that prefers not to sleep. <laughs> it, you know, we really have to do what's safe. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you for that. That's and it's, I think I just want to highlight one thing that Deb has said there is that please don't go and self-prescribe. You know, that absolutely that has to be in line with a healthcare professional. So thank yeah. you. And please go and watch that on Deb. So Deb, what do you want to talk about today? Yeah. I'm going to talk about a little bit about safe sleep and some of the safety aspects and particularly one apart that a lot of parents don't think about and that's sleep in the car. But before we get there, Deb, what would you like to be talking about? I'm surely you've got an acronym about something. <laughs> you know me so well, Sarah. Um, I do like to try and keep things simple and memorable for families. And, um, you know, when I, obviously sleep is a massive, massive subject. And we could literally talk about it for days and still not cover all of it. And I don't for one second pretend to be a sleep physician. There are actually pediatricians who um, subspecialize in sleep. But um, obviously, as a general pediatrician and mum, I certainly have a level of knowledge of it. So I guess, you know, in terms of an acronym, 
what I look at is NAP. So N-A-P, very, very easy to remember um, mm -hmm. and hopefully easy to achieve. Um, so N, N is for normal, and that's really understanding what's normal for a child. And this goes back to my, you know, my intro statement about sleep like a baby. Babies actually mm -hmm. generally don't sleep very well. You know, we, when I think of sleep like a baby, it's like hit, 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 hits the pillow, I pass out, and I don't only wake up, you know, 10, 11 hours later, mm -hmm. um, which is a rarity these days. But, you know, really, and I'm not going to go into detail of every single age. Mm -hmm. And as I said, it's beyond the scope of this. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, babies wake up frequently it's what they do and um mm -hmm. you know until and until they get a little bit older and are able to link their sleep cycles better and and mm -hmm. and not need feeding as frequently you know it is mm -hmm. very common for a baby to wake up frequently mm -hmm. um the other thing to comment on i guess in terms of what's normal is you know when you talk about a baby sleeping through what do we mean by that um mm -hmm. you know and what we really mean by that is is a um a stretch of at least five hours of sleep. So that is sleeping through for a young baby. Mm -hmm. um, and just reflecting on my personal experience, I had two, as I said, two girls. And um, my first daughter used to wake frequently. My second daughter was sleeping through 11 hours at the age of seven weeks. And that mm -hmm. was at night. So that, you know, it is same parenting, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but obviously just different children. So, you know, there's also mm -hmm. a range of um normal within your own family as well and, and and you know so I think that there's a little bit of temperament that's thrown in there as well but mm -hmm. you know when, when I think of normal I think of a 24-hour period and how much sleep your child should be getting and that is an age-dependent thing. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing that I just, that really worries me is that there are so many books out there and, you know, that have sold millions and millions of copies that talk about your child should fit into this box mm -hmm. and that your child should be doing this by this time. I can remember having a baby who was scrawny. She needed feeding, frequent feeding and reading this book. And that book was telling me that my child was broken and I knew yeah. she wasn't broken. So I threw the book across the room, like literally because I was so incensed that this book is telling me my child was broken and just went, you know what, I know that she needs this. I'm going to keep doing it. Yes, she woke up for a very, very long time. But now I have to wake her up at 11 a.m. on a Saturday. Um, so yeah. it does end. <laughs> but I think, Sarah, I mean, I, I think, um, look, kudos to you that you have the confidence to do that. But I think mm. that it's very, very hard. And I think that it's um, really hard. Yeah, you know, when you, you get these books, and I'm not going to name them, because I think everyone kind of knows the ones that do the rounds. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. um, you feel like a failure, you know, as, as a yeah. mom, if your baby's not following yeah. that. And yeah. I think that's a very slippery slope. Mm -hmm. uh, and although I think knowledge is the key, and I think, you know, obviously, that's, what's, that's why Sarah and I do this for you. <laughs> I do yeah. think that um, if things don't feel right or if things aren't seemingly going according to plan, it's always a good idea to take a step back, maybe get someone else's input, maybe get someone else's support mm -hmm. and look yep. at things from a different angle. Yep, I agree wholeheartedly. And I actually did take her um, to be seen medically to make sure there was nothing else going on and she was okay. So I knew it was just what she needed. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I guess so that's my end for normal. Understand what's normal um, and how many hours your child should be sleeping within a 24 hour period, according to their age. The A of nap is adopt a routine. And it sounds as boring as, you know, as dull as dishwater, but it's so, so useful and so, so true. <laughs> So what I always recommend to families is establish a routine that works for you as a family. Obviously, within reason, in terms of I'm not going to say you should be putting your child to bed at midnight, you know, but sometimes families want their child to stay up and see the parent who comes home from work late. So whatever works. Um, and adopt a routine and not just adopt it, document it. Because that means that there's no confusion. Anyone else who may be involved, any family member who may come to visit or babysitter mm -hmm. or whatever else, there's a very, very clear plan. Mm -hmm. um, and 
I say that and then I pause because I'm like, there needs to also be some flexibility, obviously, because mm-hmm. um, that's what life throws at you. But mm-hmm. uh, I do think that having, a, you know, a, a clear structure of, of the night, it's helped me as a parent. And I do think it helps children as well. What do I mean by a routine? I mean, you know, like the typical, it's a kind of like from a dinner time is, is often when I talk about it from dinner time, meaning that make sure that they've eaten enough so they don't wake up because they're hungry. Um, mm-hmm. And then followed by a relaxation period. And that can be, first of all, that means no screens. So I just want to put that mm-hmm. in there. So avoiding screens for at least two hours before bedtime is what I recommend. Um, and then it's a relaxation routine. So um, in our family, that's meant a nice relaxing bath. I've sometimes put some magnesium salts in there, which also help with relaxation. It's not having lots of bright lights on. Um, it's not having crazy games and running around playing tag, all those kind of things as kids get older, um, you know, or having very distressing, upsetting conversations. You know, it's really just that unwind, chill out time. You know, if we think of um, our ancestors, that was the time when probably after a meal, you're sitting around the campfire, you know, there's no electricity, obviously, and um, mm-hmm. it's dark. So that's the other thing. Um you know, for adults and older older children, you know, you can think about things like light blocking glasses, but I'm not going to go down that path here um, because really, you know, I guess we'll just focus more on, on the younger children. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, that that's around what the, the adopting a routine is about. Um, and then the P is a bit of a big bucket and that P is looking for problems and pathology. So, this is understanding the why, you know, well, if your okay. child, you know, isn't fitting in that normal, um, despite having adopted a good routine, what mm-hmm. problem could there be? You know, what what could the underlying problem be? So, you know, that, again, is beyond the scope of this. But, you know, it's and that's really fleshed out through a very thorough history and assessment, plus or minus mm-hmm. some investigations. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's about understanding, is it falling asleep is waking up frequently what happens when they wake up do they seem like they're distressed or are they just waking up happy um you know so it's really looking at at things quite thoroughly are they snoring are they mouth breathing are their teeth grinding um you know th- i mean i could keep on throwing hundreds of things at you mm-hmm. but really it, it is going through you know all the all the possible causes yeah and write it down to document it so that you've got that you understand what's happening over a period of time, particularly because if you are sleep deprived as well, then being able to recall that at your appointment with your paediatrician or your GP is going to be a lot harder. So make sure that you document all of that down so you've got that history with you. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Mm. So now it's the, it, sleep is such a massive, massive, massive topic. There really are. Is there anything um, in particular that can really affect um, babies and children's sleep from a medical point of view that perhaps, um, you know, you talked about parasites for a second there. Um, is there, uh, what kind of common things are there that really can affect kids' sleep that we should be taking our children to a doctor for? Mm, so I guess the most or common is that things that I would see... Well, it is too big. So I'm just going to kind of pick out yeah. like a couple of common things I see. Yeah. Um, one is pain. Um, so pain from any cause. And that would, the, I guess the mm-hmm. most common thing I would see would be reflux. So gastroesophageal mm-hmm. reflux, and that can happen at any age. Um, mm-hmm. Or, you know, it could be tummy pain as well. Uh, that could be from a food intolerance. It could be from constipation. Um, mm-hmm. So I guess pain would, would definitely be up there. With parasites, mm-hmm. they'll often get an itchy bottom. And, okay. you know, that, that then wakes them up and, and they're scratching mm-hmm. or they can get abdominal pain from it as well. Um, I guess the other big group is around iron deficiency. So it, it okay. sounds like counterintuitive. You go, well, you know, when I'm iron deficient, I get really low energy and all I want to do is sleep. Mm. But for children, mm. it actually flips it over and it can cause okay. disrupted sleep. So right. when I talked about those clever sleep pediatricians, mm. um, they – you know, one of the things they will always want to exclude is iron deficiency. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, if your child has ever had an iron test, the the normal levels um, are from around, and normal levels, we look at quite a few different things, but the main thing we look at is something called ferritin, which are iron storms. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. normal is from around about 20 to 150 or 200, a little bit age and lab dependent. And um, mm-hmm. I just want to flag that in my books, 21, 
you know, is not normal. You know, you want a generous iron level to establish that that's mm -hmm. not causing any problems. Yep. All right. Excellent. But again, that's something Thank to you. chat with your doctor about. Yeah, for sure. So before we wrap up today, um, and of course, hopefully what this conversation has done is that it can highlight, okay, I, I actually do need to go and see somebody about this or, you know what, what I'm experiencing, this does fit into the realm of normal for kids. So hopefully it's got you thinking about those sorts of things and not just being, you know, put into a box of exactly how things should be because that's not how children are. Um, but what I wanted to talk about quickly is um, sleeping in car seats and prams because this is something that often, you know, when we think of safe sleep, we automatically go to the cot or the bedroom or co-sleeping. We think about all of those things. And the best place for resources on this is by far the Red Nose website. I've actually popped that website to all of their safe sleep guidelines and articles um, in the uh, introductory section to this um, live. So that's there. Go and click on it afterwards and look at those resources. Everything from what to dress your child in to how the cot should be set up, whether or not you should be using pillows or bumpers, um, you know, all about co-sleeping. So it's a wealth of information. But what I want to chat about is specifically um, around the car seats and prams. So prams and car seats are designed uh, to transport your child. Okay, so it's it's designed, you know, to not to be used for an extended period of time. And the idea is, is that when we've been on a journey with our child, when we reach the destination of where we're going to and your child is asleep, that we don't leave them in the car seat or capsule. Um, a lot of people have the removable capsules that you can then, you know, carry inside. But what Red Nose um, state that you need to do is remove your child from that car seat or capsule and put them into their normal sleep space. Now, why? Okay. First of all, car seats are designed to keep your baby safe in the event of an accident, okay? So they have a significant amount of padding um, around them, you know, to absorb shock and so on. And what this can do, particularly if it's warm weather, is that it can retain heat. So this can actually be quite warm for your baby. Yes, that's absolutely, they're designed to do that. They're designed to be safe in the car while you are traveling. That is not an issue. We're all good there. But the issue is, is when we're having them for extended periods of time. So if they're having their, you know, lucky if you've got a child who is having a two hour nap, but we don't want to leave them in there for an hour's car journey. And so they're in there for like, you know, I'm picking random numbers here, but an extended period of time such as that, because it can be too warm. The other issue as well is that um, the car seats are designed to have your child on an incline. For an extended period of time, particularly with um, younger babies, what can happen is that their head can fall forward. So it flexes the neck and this can partially block the baby's airway. So this is an issue, once again, I sound like a broken neck record for an extended period of time. They are designed to be safe for your child for transportation, but not for their routine sleep. So please take them out when you get home. The other issue too is when you have them in a capsule or a car seat or if you take the part off the pram and you put them on a high surface such as a bench or a dining room table and so on, it's a falls risk. So that's another one of the issues. So that's why, you know what, they are great for transport, designed to do that, but when it's sleep time, into their normal sleep space, really important. So... Um, if you have any questions about what we've talked about so far, please, now is the time to pop them in the comments below while we are on live. Apologies that if you are watching the recording of this that we aren't able to answer your questions. Um, but what I love is the fact that um, Andromeda is now asleep um, <laughs> after <laughs> listening to all of this. <laughs> all of this talk, which I quite like. Um, and Beck has also said, um, thank you for mentioning iron deficiency. It's really helped her. Her little one is iron deficient and has never mentioned um, that it could affect sleep. So that's great. I'm so pleased, Deb, that you mentioned that um, because, yeah, it's about, it's about that knowing. So there you go. 
Um, I don't think we have any comments. So is there anything else you wanted to finish up with before we go? <laughs> um, no, I think we've covered... I think we've covered the basics and as I said, I couldn't go into too much detail. Um, and I see there's a question that's come up for you here, Sarah. Okay. As I said, I've got, a, I've got a couple of more resources on my Instagram page. So please head across yep. there. And mm -hmm. um, I've also got a blog. If you were wondering about what's normal and what's normal with the hours, maybe I'll just cut and paste it on now Fabulous. Um, so that, but... that you don't have to go and go and um, down the mm -hmm. rabbit hole of um, Google. Yeah, absolutely. So Laura has asked, any advice about babies sleeping in a car seat for a long drive for holidays? Um, take breaks. You need to have a break or well, the driver needs to have a break as well and your baby needs to have a break from the car seat. Um, so uh, that is make sure that you stop, you take them out, they have some time out of the seat and then back in again. Okay. So um, I actually, off the top of my head, I cannot remember whether it's every one or two hours that is recommended. Um, I'm sorry, I will. Uh, it is in the Red Nose um, guidelines there. So remember the links up above. I just can't remember off the top of my head whether it was a break every one or two hours. Can't remember. So, mm -hmm. but yes, the important thing, you know, just as good for the driver, you need to stop every two hours when you're driving a long distance. So Bob needs to come out of the seat too. Okay. Well, we will be back again next week. And remember, please jump onto Deb's Instagram to watch the um, Instagram live on melatonin. It is really worth watching. And we will see you at the same time and the same place uh, next Wednesday, um, 2 p.m. Uh, Australian Eastern Standard Time. Okay. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Bye.